Good morning. Is everybody ready for Thanksgiving? I thought we would start early this morning. Um, so our church has been contributing to a fund that we call Adoption Assistance, and we recently were able to help our very first uh, couple uh, be able to bring home their child. They were actually watching on live stream this morning and for the first time they were saying and praying the name of Jesus over their brand new family. Can we just thank God for that? Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, how many enjoyed uh, Pastor Jonathan's message last Sunday? He did a great job. Yeah. And uh, you might not know, but this month actually marks 14 years he has been on staff at Calvary Assembly, entering his 15th year. And uh, so he will tell you half of that was the interview to get the job, but that's not quite true. <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, uh, just uh, it won't matter so much to this service, but in the next service it will. And that is right after the, the game, or right after the service today, I'm heading to the game. And... Uh, for the Buffalo Bills. When I'm in the stadium, <laughs> when I'm in the stadium, they don't lose and they need my help. And <laughs> so, um, what, one other thing before I get started this morning, and that is uh, sometimes when it gets to Thanksgiving time, people get a little apprehensive about gathering together with family uh, and, and friends and not sure where the conversation could go. And so uh, what we've done is uh, we actually provided uh, 52 questions that you could ask around the Thanksgiving table that would help you understand and better enjoy your time with your family and friends. It's questions for anyone, questions for grandparents, questions for married people, questions for, there's somebody else, oh, growing up, yeah. A lot, of, a lot of great things you could learn about your family. And wonderful thing about some of our grandparents and older folks, the older they get, they lose their filter. You might actually hear things you've never heard before. So. Um, <laughs> young people don't have their filter yet, so I kind of know what to expect. Uh, we're in a series about being surprised by grace, and we're taking a look at the life of Moses. And... Uh, and we're, we're stunned, really, by how often the grace of God shows through in the life of a man that we equate with law and judgment. And this morning's uh, example of this is no uh, different, and we'll pick it up, the story in uh, Exodus chapter 17. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin. That's not a moral term, it's, it's actually a Hebrew word. It, it means either thorny or clay place, so they're, they're leaving that. And they're traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, what am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the, uh, the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? I think a, a point I'd like you to think about as we process this information is breaking chains and changing hearts is not the same thing. Breaking chains and changing hearts is not the same thing. It's very easy to assume that whatever is holding us back in life or limiting life in some way is the problem. And if we could resolve or remove that issue, then our lives would be better. It would be what we wanted them to be. 
Um, so we, we sometimes think in terms like this, if I could be free of that person in my life, that person is limiting my life. Then I, and, and, and they, maybe they get rid of that person in their life. Have you ever noticed how often they wind up in a relationship with someone just like that? How, how does that happen? If I could just break this addiction, then my life would be better. And how often do we see people who break the addiction but then return to that addiction or another addiction? If, if I could just have a, a change of heart. Well, the truth is, is, without a change of heart, we will tend to gravitate back to the chains of bondage. Israel came to a place where there was no water. Now, they'd been in a similar situation just two chapters earlier in Exodus chapter 15 where there was water, but it was undrinkable, and God miraculously supplied a way to remedy that water and to make it drinkable for them. So what did they learn from that experience? The answer is nothing. They didn't learn anything from that experience. And so the, when they get to this situation, this is now the fourth time that Exodus records that they're complaining, and they actually elevate their complaint. They, they complained in chapter 14, in chapter 15, in chapter 16, in chapter 17, and how many have a sneaking suspicion this will not be the last time they complain. Yeah. And uh, so they, but this time they elevated uh, their complaint. And uh, what they did <clears throat> is they quarreled. They didn't just say they didn't like something, they, they started a quarrel. And in the Hebrew word, it's, it's kind of interesting, the uh, underlying idea behind this is, is it's like a lawsuit, like you're bringing somebody to court. You're suing them. And uh, Moses is being accused, basically, of attempting genocide, bringing this entire nation out into the wilderness so that they will all die. And, and Moses says, he, you can notice the phrase that they are about to stone me. That's not just him exaggerating the situation. That's how angry and frustrated they were. So they're ready to execute Moses. Moses had not been leading them to water. Moses had been leading them where God told him. This is the thing about us. We often think that what God does is he leads us from this place to provision, to provision, to provision. And God actually has another agenda that he's working on in, in our lives. He wants to teach us things about the life of faith, and he wants to teach us how to trust him. And as it turns out, if all we have is all the provision we always need, we don't learn to trust. We don't. Uh, this is how the psalmist would say it in Psalm 95, if you would only listen to his voice today. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as you did, as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For there your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. Give us water to drink. Now they've moved into a demanding mode. Don't raise your hand, but how many know somebody who's like that? They don't ask, they demand, and it becomes a problem. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? You see, they're imagining the worst possible outcome, and they're projecting it into the future. And they're imagining that that worst possible outcome is intentional, and they see a motive behind it. And so they, they accuse Moses and God of having these horrible motives. And then they say, is, the, is not the Lord among us? This is a challenge for us because we tend to think that if there is a need, God must be absent, that the presence of a need proves the absence of God. They have a lot they need to learn in the situation that they are in. And the question I have for you, are we really any different? Do we assume that the... the God is supposed to provide for every need in advance so that we never have to work through anything, walk through anything, or learn anything. Do we ever assume that God has a hidden motive? Maybe not for everybody, but at least for us. I know he does some nice things for some people, but it seems like when it comes to me, and then we, we assume a hidden motive. Do we believe that the presence of a problem proves the absence of God in our lives? So in essence, Israel is putting God on trial. It's like a court-martial. 
And, the, and, and it says that this is where they put God to the test. And God had originally intended to test them here and teach them, but they turned the tables and they put God on trial, like a trial of ordeal. In fact, the word there is in Hebrew, it's rib, and it actually means like a covenant lawsuit. So they present all their grievances. They make all their accusations. They charge God with a failure to provide for them. They charge God with a failure to protect them. And they charge God with failure to be present with them. So God is guilty, guilty, guilty. And what are they going to do with their verdict? And the answer is uh, they're going to kill somebody. If we're all going to die in the wilderness, we're going to kill the person that God gave to us. And that's Moses and he's going to go first. Well, what's fascinating is in all of this, God still meets the need of Israel because God is gracious. And if someone were making that kind of accusation about you, how would you respond? And God responds with grace. Now, last week, Pastor Jonathan talked about how God fed them and taught them how to rest. This week, we're going to see how God provides water for them. So this is fascinating and a reasonable question for us to think about. Why don't we believe God's provision, previous help, reveals his intentions towards us? Like if I ask, has God ever done anything for you in your life at some point? I think most of us would raise our hand. But when we think about the future, we're not so sure. We don't assume that because he helped us. It's almost like we... Maybe he did that by an accident or an oversight or because we were connected to somebody else. And, and they, we don't project God's blessings in our thinking. When we have a problem, we project that really well. We struggle to project on the provision that we have in our life. In fact, uh, if, if you have enough money right now, I'm pretty much sure you still want more. And uh, if you have a, a retirement savings account, I'm pretty sure you would like to have more money in there than you have right now. And if you are employed with a company, I'm pretty sure you'd like to get more money from that company than you're currently being compensated. And if you own a company, I'm pretty sure you would like to see the profit margin higher than it is right now. And the nature of provision is not that it brings peace to us. It's that now that I have this, I'm going to need more because, well, we don't know how things are going to turn out. So we project our problems and we panic because we can't see the pattern of grace. That's why we panic. We naturally project our problems. We don't project provision. We need a better perspective. We need the perspective of grace. So uh, the rock of Horeb, Horeb means it's a dry place, it's a desolate place. You wouldn't really expect to find water there. That's part of their frustration. Why would Moses lead them to a place where there's no expectation to find water? And Moses doesn't know what to do. The good news is God knows what to do. So when we don't know what to do, that doesn't mean God is confused or perplexed. He knows what to do. And he told Moses, take some of the elders of Israel, walk before the uh, congregation of Israel. And, and, he, and, and what he's doing is, is, this is a symbol of convening a court. Right? You want a trial? Here's the court. He assembles the jury. Here's the elders. And look at this. God told Moses to take the staff that he used to strike the Nile. What is this? This is the picture of judgment. When, when, when Moses struck the Nile and the waters turned to blood, that was a picture of God's judgment. So, so now everybody's seeing this picture. This court is being convened. We have a jury. And here comes someone with the, the staff that represents judgment. I guarantee every eye was locked. Like something is going to happen here. The Israelites knew what that staff represented. And Moses was told to strike the rock. Why would God tell him to do that? This is a picture of judgment. It's a picture of judgment. 
They're putting God on trial and they're going to judge God. And before you think that that's so out of bounds, are you sure we don't do the same thing? How many times when there's some atrocity in the world, do you hear the reoccurring mantra of our culture? If God were real and if God were good and if God were powerful, how could God allow these things? Who's to blame? We have people committing horrible atrocities. Who's to blame? Must be God's fault. Must be. We put God on trial. And if we get some reasonable information, we might find him not guilty. This is the, it's baked into the human heart. Something goes wrong, it must be God's fault. If it resolves in a positive way, or someone can explain it to us, then maybe we'll let God off the hook this time. What they want God to do is to prove he is God by doing what they want him to do. This is not a new thing. This is not just a human thing. When Jesus was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, isn't that not the thing that Satan kept saying? If you're really the son of God, if you're really the son of God, then prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it how? Prove it by making sure there is no lack of provision. There is no lack of protection. There is no lack of presence. Prove it. So uh, you can't get water from a rock. It's too hard. But here's the lesson. God's grace flows in hard places. Is there anybody in the room who's glad about that? Yeah. His grace flows in hard places. We don't like being in a position where God is our only source. We prefer multiple options. But eventually, the multiple option resources in our life do dry up. What I will tell you is it's hard to learn to trust when you've got lots of options. Take the staff with which you struck the Nile. Then there's a phrase. We wouldn't notice it because our culture doesn't think like this. But God says, then I will stand before you. If we were in the ancient world, that would have stunned us. Such language would never have been written. It was inconceivable. It's not how the world worked. The greater does not stand before the lesser. You stand before God. You stand before kings. You stand before priests. You stand before prophets. They don't stand before you. But he says, I will stand before you. And he says, I will go over by the rock. Some translations even say on the rock. God is the one who's on trial. And what does God tell Moses to do? Take the rod of judgment and strike the rock. What is God doing here? He is submitting himself to judgment, not to their judgment, but to his own. And God was responding to the prayers of Moses. What shall I do? They are ready to stone me. Someone is going to die and it's going to be me. And what is God saying? I will take the judgment upon me. Does that sound even remotely familiar? God delivered his people by submitting to his own rod of judgment. He took the strike in Moses' place. Moses strikes the rock, and God opens up the rock, and water flows out of it. Moses had been on trial, but the truth is God had been on trial, and they blamed him for the problems that were in their life. So what is the sentence? The sentence is always the same. The sentence is death. They did it to Jesus. Jesus came and he healed and he spoke truth and he shined light and he helped the poor and he fed the hungry. He did remarkable things. He had no home. He knew what it was like to be hungry and thirsty. He knew what it was like to be deprived of all rights. And what did they do to him? They stripped him, they mocked him, they beat him, and they condemned him to die. And then they crucified him. And what is happening on the cross? God is taking the judgment on himself. 
He's revealing his heart to us. He's teaching us how to trust in the midst of a hard time. And you say, oh, pastor, that's quite a stretch. You almost had me there. And that's quite a stretch. Well, this isn't my stretch. First Corinthians, the 10th chapter. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. To refer to God as a rock was a very common thing in the Old Testament. In Genesis and Isaiah, he's the stone of Israel. In Deuteronomy, the 32nd chapter, he's the rock that works perfection. In Psalms chapter 18, he's the rock that is a fortress and a refuge. In Psalm 95 and Deuteronomy 32, he's the rock of salvation. What is supposed to be stricken? The rock. What comes out? The water of life. I'll ask the worship team to come up. This was a picture of how God would submit to the blow of his own justice. On the cross, Christ was struck with divine judgment. It was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. An angry world stands with clenched fists and blames God for all the things that go wrong in our life and all the things that we don't have in our life. And what does God do? He allows himself to be put on trial and the judgment comes down. And what comes out? Life, grace. When Jesus was pierced, tells us in scripture that out of his side came water and blood. In John chapter 4, Jesus said, whoever drinks of the water that I give, they will never be thirsty again. He would go on to say, the water that I give them, if they believe in me, they will become, it will become a spring of living water unto eternal life that wells up within them. Will you allow God to teach you to trust him? Or have you decided that the only faith that will work for you is if no faith is required at all and you can walk from provision to provision, getting whatever you want well in advance? Will you put God on trial if something is not going the way you prefer in your life? Don't get me wrong. It's not wrong to tell God what you're afraid of. It's not wrong to tell God what you need. That's part of prayer. But we sometimes don't understand that. And we take it a step further and we put God on trial for what's not going well in our lives. The good news is, the good news is he understands. Jesus took the full blow of judgment of God and the water of life flowed freely from him. And the question is, will you drink from that water? Will you bow your heads? Maybe the question that you're asking in the season that you're in is how can anything good come out of this place of lack, this place of pain, this place of frustration, this place of anxiety? And I know it's hard. I've been in those places. I don't like them. I know what it's like to wonder and worry. But I can also tell you that what I've learned in my journey in life 
is that my greatest fears are not actually true. That God is not against me. And even when I falsely accuse him, he's ready in that midst of that hard and painful place to release the life that I need. And he'll do it for you. He'll do it for you today if you'll trust him. So Father, we're not saying everything is wonderful, but we are looking to you. Will you release unto us today the waters of life? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.